Hello, and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival. I'm Philip Bahar, the executive director of the festival, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Margaret Atwood, Dearly. Today's program is generously underwritten by our longtime festival supporter, Ellen Stone Bellick, whose support has enabled us to present some of the preeminent women authors and thinkers of our day, from Gloria Steinem and Roxane Gay to Julia Kristeva and Camille Paglia, just to name a few. And we're really excited to have Margaret Atwood for this year's Bellick program. This week's programs are also generously supported by Bank of America. And our book selling partner is Women and Children First, Chicago's feminist bookstore, celebrating and amplifying underrepresented voices since 1979. You can learn more about the festival and our year round programming or become a member at chicagohumanities.org. You can also make a donation right now by clicking the donate button on YouTube. Thank you to our captioner for making this and all of our programs more accessible. You can control the captioning on your YouTube controllers and you can learn more about our accessible services at chicagohumanities.org access. Needless to say, Margaret Atwood is one of the most popular and beloved authors of her generation, creating both best-selling and groundbreaking works such as The Testaments, Oryx and Crake and The Handmaid's Tale which has had many lives and continues to resonate with audiences in print, on the screen, big screen and small screen. Um, and poetry has been at the heart of Atwood's practice from the beginning of her career in her first publication, Double Persephone. With nearly 20 collections to her name, Dearly has been long awaited being her first book of poetry in over a decade. With that, please help me in welcoming the festival's Marilyn Toma Artistic Director, Allison Cuddy and the incomparable Margaret Atwood. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a delight to be here, uh, especially during this historic week. Um, at my last count, I think there were close to 700 people signed up for this event. So welcome to you all. I'm thrilled that you're here with us. And Margaret Atwood, it is such an honor to speak with you. I'm, I'm just thrilled you're here as well. Uh, and, you know, we're so honored by your presence that we really did have to kind of get that election wrapped up so we could just focus on this conversation. So just a small gift to you for your presence here tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it deeply, uh, partly because, of course, nobody up here was sleeping and we were all we were all doom scrolling on our phones. Um, and we thought we might have to, you know, get organized and and um, brew up the cups of tea for all the fleeing refugees that we would have to welcome. But, but it looks like that's not going to happen. No, hopefully not. Um, we'll see how things um, shake out from here. And I have lots of questions for you about that. But I just was curious, can you talk about beyond brewing tea for the, the coming uh, refugees? What is the view from there? And how what does all of this look like to you? You're such a chronicler. For someone who is the personification of Canadian literature, you are also a chronicler of the American experience, the American character. And I'm just curious what you're thinking right now and what this has all meant to you going through this period of time. Deep roots, Allison. <laughs> My ancestors were some of those very same Quaker hanging, um, witch persecuting um, New Englanders of the 17th century. So it's it's okay for me to talk about them. We're related. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most hair raising experiences of my life was I was doing a book signing in, in Boston and a young woman came up and she said, I am the great, 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 great granddaughter of Rebecca Nurse. So if you don't know anything about the Salem event, Rebecca Nurse was the uh, person wrongly hanged who gave a very stirring gallows speech saying why she had refused to lie. Um, so that was a moment for me. Anyway, why, why am I interested? Well, <laughs> I just told you. Uh, I've lived in the st States quite a few times and in different parts of it. And I've, I've always bet on the fact that it's diverse enough and ornery enough so that it would actually be rather hard to turn it into a lockstep totalitarianism without killing a lot of people. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, but it would be. Um, and um, that that is different from some other countries where uh, it's easier to get people line up to line up um, and all do the same thing. 
So I, I was counting on that, which, whichever way it went. And um, Americans should realize that a lot of people in the world would like them to fail. They would like American democracy to fail because then they can say, okay, look, it doesn't work. You're better off having an autocracy with me at the head of it. Mm -hmm. um, but but if, if it does work, then that is a higher standard of personal liberty uh, than these other people are making available. These other people, you know who you are, other people. <laughs> so it would not be a good thing for American democracy to fail. Absolutely not. And, and you know, a a really challenging time when those questions about the failure of American democracy are coming from within America, right? Well, they shouldn't anymore because it hasn't failed. <laughs> uh, I mean, some people are calling it in question. They're calling the process in question. They're insulting a lot of hardworking election officials. Um, and they're, they're insulting a lot of, in fact, Republican heads of states. Mm -hmm. um, implying that they're dishonest. I mean, I would stop that if I were them. It's, it's uh, not going down well. Yeah, yeah, that's heartening. Um, you know, this, this election season comes in the midst of a global pandemic. You know, yeah. you, you kind of called that. <laughs> not exactly. I mean, maybe not intentionally. Yeah, pandemics are recurring. Yeah. If you go back in history, you can see them coming round again. And, and we had a few that didn't quite get off the ground. Um, even in this, this century, we had, we had SARS, we had a West Nile, which I, in fact, got from a crow in the backyard. Um, and H1N1, they, they, they didn't take off the way this one has. And that has, any epidemiologist will tell you, it has, it has to do with the um, incubation period. And, and how easily and how and how easily a disease is spread. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, this one got out of the box and I hope that the lesson will be um, be prepared next time, which epidemiologists have been telling officials for a very long time. We're not prepared enough. And uh, that has show, been shown to be true. However, note of hope, there is another side there is uh, the other side. There, there always is. Will things be exactly the same when we get to the other side? No, they will not be because they never are. Um, but there will be a vaccine. And what I also hope there will be quite soon is an Insta test, by which I mean not 15 minutes, but like scan my movie ticket. Mm. Um, yes, no, and that means that if we go into a room for events with a lot of other people, they will have been scanned too, and they will not be infectious. And that's what will permit live events to come back, because as we know, the people who have been hardest hit by, by this, among the people who have been hardest hit, have been live performance artists. So singers, dancers, actors, musicians um, have been really affected. Yeah. Writers, not so much. We, we crouch in rooms anyway by ourselves talking to people who weren't there. So it's, it's, it's not um, a great difference in our, in our practice. We, we can't go on book tours, but a book tour is not the same as, as writing a book. True, true. You can still practice, but there is something about that. You know, I mean, personally, I was so looking forward to being together with you in a room and having a large audience there with us and, and not having that, that vibrancy of conversation feels like a loss. Although, I, I'm happy to be having this conversation by these means. It's a loss of something, but if I were in a in a live venue with you in Chicago, you wouldn't be seeing my my study in the background. Think of that. That's true. I'm getting a glimpse into your life. You, <laughs> you seem to be doing well, um, and you know, I was going to ask what you have been up to during the pandemic. I mean, obviously you've been doing this kind of thing. You were touring around the paperback or touring around the paperback of the Testaments. And now this is the first, the first event, right, for Dearly. I mean, yeah. you may have done some interviews, but your first uh, conversation. So that's an honor. Yes. And I've been in Chicago lots before, as you know, and I've been at w Women and Children first before and going back some time into the past. 
Uh, so they've been there since 1979, mm -hmm. and um, and they're still there. So so that's good too. Yeah, you'll be happy to know that that neighborhood that where they are, Andersonville in Chicago, was uh, one of the liveliest celebrations post. You know, once uh, Biden was declared president elect, um, one of the liveliest celebrations in the city, I think, took place there. So. Um, well, what a, my goodness. Oh, uh, yes, it ain't over. Um, and, and of course, it never is. It's never over because it is a very diverse country. And um, there, there are many different shades of points of view, but the, the choice is always pretty binary. You know, so how do people make up their minds to vote? They may, they may have a bundle of things that are important to them, and one side may represent some of those things, and the other side may represent some of the other things. So they're going to have to do triage amongst their interests. Uh, so that's not easy. We we've got five or six political parties. I forget actually how many. Um, so we have. <laughs> Uh, our our things are spread into spread out into diff more baskets. So yeah. it's the party system. Well, I want to talk about dearly. Um, you know, one of the pleasures I've had during the anxiety of this election season was revisiting your work and and reading dearly. Um, and I thank you so much for. I mean. It's funny to think about reading about a post-apocalyptic world is reassuring <laughs> or a form of managing anxiety in this moment, but certainly it was. And, and this collection of poetry is just so wonderful. I mean, it's, it's melancholy and moody, but it's smart and sharp and witty and irreverent. Um, magical, weird, you know, there's a moment where a spider instructs us, come to terms before you were, I am. I arrange the rain, I take harsh care. Uh, there's another moment where a drone narrates the, the destruction it wreaks and asks, was I bad? <laughs> Which is so open to so many interpretations as it should be. Um, but I wanted you, before you read one of your poems to talk a little bit about the poem Zombie uh, mm -hmm. and this quote that um, introduces the poem, which is from Rilke, the quote is, poetry is the past that breaks out in our heart. So can you talk a little bit about that interaction between poetry, Rilke, and zombies? Well, <laughs> I think we need to think about that for about one minute. Uh, the cult classic, of course, is, is Night of the Living Dead mm -hmm. original version. Uh, which I think they made for some paltry sum, and it's since, of course, it's had a remake, but the, the original is better. Um, and and that is exactly what you see. You, you see the, the, uh, the zombies are, are coming up out of the ground. Um, so the, the Rilke quote is uh, can be read a number of different ways. One of them would be quite positive. The image would be of a flower you know, coming up, the breaks out in our hearts, break out, however, suggests <laughs> disease. Uh, and and another way of, of imagining it would be this very zombie um, reemergence of the past. Mm -hmm. and, um, zombie stories and, and in particular vampire stories um, are about the past. So of, the, of those three groups of things, um, werewolves, zombies, and and vampires. Um, people have theorized about this quite a lot in far corners of academia, other places. <laughs> uh, but one person has gone into it quite a bit. Naomi Alderman says that that vampires are are popular when people are feeling quite affluent, because the thing about vampires is they're always pretty rich. Mm -hmm that they've had a long time to accumulate stuff and uh, they're articulate they're quite chatty uh, they have conversations with people they have they like talking about their past uh, in various uh, books that we've had recently whereas whereas zombies are not they don't have much to say in fact they don't have anything to say and uh, vampires are individualists but but zombies are only dangerous if they're in a crowd. 
One of my pals is is the same Naomi Alderman who invented a, a, a game called Zombies Run. It's actually an exercise aid because exercise is so boring. <laughs> So you download Zombies Run into your into your phone and you listen to it. It tells you a story. And the story is that you're one of the few surviving human beings in a couple of enclaves where they're holding out against the zombie hordes. And you've been sent out to gather things like um, bottles of water, band-aids, you know, necessities of life. And you're running, so it's usually you're running. It's for runners. So I said, Naomi, I'm, I can't run. I'm I can walk. She said, Oh, you can gear it to your own speed. <laughs> the story, and um, you're running along, and your your dispatcher says, All clear. Pick up the bottle of water. Pick up the band aids. Oh, I've made a terrible mistake. There's zombies all around you. Run, and then you have to run just fast enough to escape the zombies and it tracks your heart rate and your speed and all of these things. And I think it's now in its eighth or ninth season. So it has an ongoing narrative, but it also makes it interesting for you to do your exercising and um, gives you incentives. Mm -hmm. And um, is an, a yeah. metaphor for poetry. As a metaphor for poetry, it connects back to the Rilke quote. Um, so the, the past isn't always um, joyful to remember. <laughs> who was it who said the past, the past isn't over? The past, in fact, it's not even past. I think right. it was. Um, so we are all uh, haunted by not only our own past, but by the past of wherever it is that we live. And... Um, those those things in the past, if they've been pretty traumatic, you will you will usually find that there's a period of oblivion in which everybody just doesn't talk about them, whatever they may be. Mm. But then, back around it comes. So people start digging things up. People start uh, writing about past events. People revisit these things that we were not supposed to talk about or even know about and back they come. And I think we're in one of those periods right now. In the United States of America, we're in a, a same, the same kind of period in Canada, except what we're hearing about is how um, indigenous people were treated in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, something that you just weren't supposed to know about. That's why Canadian history was so boring. Did did you go to high school in Canada? Yes, I did. Wasn't yeah. it? It was so boring. It was all about wheat. Uh, we weren't told the interesting things because they were discreditable. <laughs> My opinion. I mean, there were some interesting things. World War One was pretty interesting, but and so was World War Two. But 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 the stuff that that happened on this continent. Um, of a discreditable kind was not spoken about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to that um, and Canada's reckoning with its past um, even more recently through politics. But let's let's have a poem because you were talking about three figures that are um, connected with the past, the vampire, the zombie, and the werewolf. Yeah, werewolves are not about the past. They're okay. about the animal side. Um, so they used to be about, if you're old enough to remember old werewolf movies, they were, they were about um, men turning into animals. So Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is basically a werewolf story, <laughs> even gets hairier. Um, but what made it different for its time was that it wasn't the moon that was the transformative agent, it was this chemical, very up to date for the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, so in those old werewolf movies, the werewolves were the werewolves were always male figures, but in recent years we have had um, some gender expansion for werewolves. <laughs> Progress. Yeah, yeah. We actually have female werewolves in some uh, films and accounts, some novels. There's some pretty good novels in which the uh, central figure is a female werewolf. Um, quite convincing. 
nothing to do with my personal life, you understand. Hey, absolutely not. We won't go there. <laughs> so, so you're going to read? Update on werewolves. I have to stop calling them werewolves. It has to be werewolves. Update on werewolves. In the old days, all werewolves were male. They burst through their blue jean clothing, as well as their own split skins, exposed themselves in parks, howled at the moonshine, those things frat boys do. Went too far with the pigtail yanking, growled down into the pink and wriggling females who cried, wee, 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 all the way to the bone. Heck, it was only flirting, plus a candid sense of fun. See Jane run. But now it's different. No longer gender specific. Now it's a global threat. Long legged women sprint through ravines and furry warm ups. A pack of kinky models in Sado French Vogue get ups and airbrushed short term memories bent on no penalties rampage. Look at their red rimmed paws. Look at their gnashing eyeballs. Look at the backlit gauze of their full moon subversive halos. Hairy all over this bell down, and it's not a sweater. Oh, freedom, freedom and power, they sing as they lope over bridges, bums to the wind, ripping out throats on footpaths, pissing off brokers. Tomorrow they'll be back in their middle management black and Jimmy Choo's with hours they can't account for, and first date's blood on the stairs. They'll make a few calls. Goodbye, it isn't you, it's me. I can't say why. At sales meetings, they'll dream of sprouting tails right in the audio visuals. They'll have addictive hangovers and ruined nails. <laughs> Wonderful. So that was an update on werewolves from Dearly, your newest collection. Um, you know, I mean, obviously there's something playful and tongue in cheek about that poem, but it there's also, it's a violent poem in a way as well. And, and well, I've- Violent, yes. Go ahead, sorry. Werewolves are violent. Yes, very violent. Um, do not to be trusted. Uh, the. I'm curious about that. Um, you're, you have a kind of unflinching ability to describe violence, the human capacity for violence, the animal capacity for violence, uh, imaginary or not. And, and is that something that came easily or early to you? Or is that something you had to still yourself to and develop in okay. terms of the writing? For every character in a book and also for every person you meet, it's, it's very interesting to know when they were born, you know, what year they were born in, because that can give you a clue as to what happened to them between the ages of one and five, what happened between the ages of five and 10, what happened between 10 and 20, you know, what, what was going on? So I was born in 1939, November. What had already started? World War II. So the early part of my life was spent in World War II, luckily not on the battleground, but in the atmosphere of World War II. And everybody knew, including kids, that there was a war going on. And uh, I had an older brother who was extremely aware. And what were all the little boys doing? They were playing war games. They were collecting airplane cards that you could get out of cigarette packages. Um, the uh, what media there was, was was pretty wartime geared, and that would include radio serials, and it would include the black and white comic books that were available at that time in, in Canada. Uh, so that wasn't, that wasn't far away. And so going along with my life story, I was there for 10 in 1949, when we were still very post-war. Um, but it places me at, at 15 when Elvis Presley makes his appearance. <laughs> that's a big jump, you know, from World War II to Elvis Presley. That's quite far to travel. Things changed very quickly. 
-hmm. from about 1950 on, and they changed again about 1966. So the 60s, by the way, was a violent decade. It was a, a, a decade of turmoil, very rapid change. It was a civil rights movement. It was the Vietnam War. It was the assassination of Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. Um, was like, what just happened? Like that. Um, so this is this is part of the world that we live in. I, I did not um, live a sheltered life as far as that kind of thing went. And I also, because I grew up in the north of Canada um, during war, what did we eat? <laughs> what did we eat? Well, we were out in the woods. We fished. What does fishing mean? It means you catch the fish and then you kill it and then you um, and then you gut it. So I'm, I was quite aware of, of what was inside um, biological beings. I, I never thought that food came from the supermarket. Yeah. So much more in touch with the processes of life than, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yes. Uh, some kids that uh, they think that what they're eating just comes out of a package. They they don't they don't make the connection back. Um, yes, very very close to um, life in many varieties, and um, and if you're close to we we did live on a farm for ten years, and we asked a farmer uh, what animal should we get, and he said none, and then he said. <laughs> If you've got, if you're going to have livestock, you're going to have dead stock, and that's true too. So if you're on a farm with animals, something's going to die sooner or later. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about things changing rapidly uh, and kind of what just happened, and I'm really struck by uh, the origin story of you as a writer that you've told. That you know, you were almost struck or a poem appeared in your head one day when you were walking home from school. Origin story. Uh, there must be more to it than that. Those things don't just happen. Yeah. Uh, so I was an, an, an early reader and I read very widely, uh, but I didn't have any intention of, of being a writer uh, up until then. Uh, I was going to be in succession. I was going to be a painter. I was going to be a um, fashion designer, believe it or not. It's pretty funny. Um, I was going to be, after we were after we were given the guidance handbook that said what careers we should have, and there were only five for girls, uh, I was going to, I didn't want to be any of them, but I was going to be the one that paid the most, which was home economist, which is why I can't type. <laughs> I can do zippers, but I can't type. Uh, and then I was going to be a biologist. I was quite good at that. But then I I got this idea that I was going to be a writer, much to the horror of my parents, I'm sure. They bit their tongues. She'll get over it. It's a phase. Yeah. Well, what, you know, what was it about that moment, though? I mean, as you said, you, you were widely read. You'd considered many other things. What was it about that moment that you recall that made that so clear to you? that realization. It actually knows. Um, it's very hard to think yourself back into what you were like when you were 16. I can remember what I was wearing, uh, which was a, a beautiful princess line creation that I had sewed. <laughs> I bet you don't even know what the princess line was, but it was quite flattering to the figure. You sewed it in panels, had a sort of skirt that went like that. Um, and it just seemed to me very involving. So I guess people who use these terms would say it was a flow moment. Mm. A flow moment when you're very identified with whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, people who play sports describe them quite a lot, especially people like tennis players. They're in the, the flow of the whatever's going on with the tennis ball. Um, so, so that's what it was, and why I thought that it was possible for me to be a writer was was simply ignorance. I, I was not aware of what it would actually involve. What 
were you reading at that time? Were you reading poets? Okay, so 16, I was reading um, three kinds of books. Books that were on the school curriculum, which in the 50s in Canada was pretty English. So you quite a few dead English men, but some dead English women too. So you could be a woman and a writer, but you just had to be dead in English. Uh, some Americans dead, um, and except for Emily Dickinson, uh, male. And um, not Canadians much because we didn't know about them. They were not being taught in our school. Um, so I was reading that at school, those school books. Uh, books in the cellar of our house, which included a lot of science fiction. So my dad had quite a leaning towards it and detective stories. He liked to read uh, sci-fi and detective stories. So we had a large number of those, which I went through pretty quickly. Uh, and a third kind of book, which you would find in the houses of people you were babysitting for. And those would be uh, things like Forever Amber, and, you know, verboten, you're not supposed to be reading this, grown-up books with sex in them of the 20th century. 19th century novels, the sex always took place off stage, uh, which is why I frequently didn't know what was going on in these books. What, what just happened? <laughs> Another one of those experiences. What was going on in the woods? <laughs> Enlighten me, no. Um, it was the days of newspapers when they would say things like somebody would be found murdered and they would say, but she had not been interfered with. And I would say, what are they talking about? <laughs> so, yes, it was an age of, of greater verbal innocence than the one we live in now. I was, I was reading a lot of poetry. We got the English poets. We got... Oh, Keats, Tennyson, Wordsworth, and Byron. Um, and how did I end up in English literature and in college? Um, I thought first I was going to be a journalist, but my parents, to head that off, invited over a real journalist that they actually knew, who said if I was a, a girl working at a newspaper, I would be writing either the obituaries or the ladies' pages, and that would be it. So I thought, not going to do that. Um, so I, I resignedly decided that I would have to go to university and, and, um, and study English, which I did. And taught English and taught. I did. Yes. Off and on, I did teach it. Um, I was a Victorianist and, uh, also, uh, American romantics. Hmm. So AMA about American romantics plus the 17th century, which I had to study, it was my gap. Uh, we didn't study American 17th century writing in Canada, but uh, but there it was, waiting for me, uh, and all my forgotten relatives, behaving badly in the 17th century. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because one of the contexts that um, people talk about when they talk about The Handmaid's Tale, for example, is the rise of the religious right during the um, Reagan era. But um, you write about also studying the Puritans, the American Puritans, and I wonder, do you see a through line? I mean, to you, are the, the contemporary evangelical Christians uh, kind of a continuation of Puritanism, or are they very distinct to you? It's a direct through line. Uh, so we, we could go into this in, in some detail, but every time you hear somebody like George W. Bush quoting a city upon a hill, a light to all nations, they are quoting a 17th century theologian. Um, you won't find that exact wording in the Bible. It's a, it's a portmanteau of, of two bits of the Bible that this 17th century theologian stuck together. Um, so American exceptionalism goes right back there. They, they thought they were escaping England. They were going to sit, set up the perfect uh, godly society in, in uh, the new world because the old world wasn't letting them do that. But after they left, of course, Cromwell won um, the war against the monarchy and had a protectorate for some years. And 
American Puritans then thought that maybe they'd left too soon. Maybe <laughs> maybe they sort of missed the boat. Uh, but then, of course, Cromwell died. There was the Restoration, and that's when um, England imposed governors from England on New England, and that was considered a great falling off. Anyway, it's a fascinating history. It's it's um, the the good part of of um, the Puritans was the the engaging of one's conscience, you know, the individual conscience, the individual relationship uh, was very important. And there's a lot of negatives that we could also talk about, but but not to be dismissed as an influence on everything that has happened since. And you can see it going all the way through Hawthorne um, and various revival moments, the same themes come back again. So yes, I would say that there's a direct line, and um, and that is why my Gilead Society draws so heavily upon that kind of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. The the historic, I mean, thinking about the social context or the historic context is important to thinking about your novels, um, and the historical moment in which you wrote. The Handmaid's Tale, or we're thinking about or writing the early 80s versus the historical moment in which you wrote the Testaments, much more recent. How do you compare those two historic moments to one another? Well, <laughs> in the um, early 80s, we had, we had had the 60s, quite a lot of turmoil, quite a few changes. Uh, the 70s, rise of, of the second wave women's movement. Um, so you can almost pinpoint it to the moment when it became public in 1969. There had been some some roiling about in in the underbrush before that, but when the general public became conscious of this, I think you could say it was about 1969. And then through the early 70s, there was a lot of turmoil in that area. Quite a few marriages broke up. Um, a friend of mine who is a lesbian writer had all these women appearing at her door saying they wanted to be lesbians. <laughs> How did you do that? Um, so, so that was happening, and and then and then Reagan got elected. So again, let's let's go back to the future. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some stability. We're gonna have you know daddiness again. And um, we are going to um, change things back, which he proceeded to do. And that's when the religious right, which had not been, they had been pietists um, up until then, decided they were going to be a political power. So I started reading what people were saying they would do if they had the power. And one of the things they said they would like to do is put women back into the home where they belonged. So I thought, well, how are they going to get them to go back in? You know, they're all running around out there having jobs and bank accounts and other um, ungodly things that they're too dim-witted to really be able to handle. Um, plus, they can vote. So, so how are you going to get those women back in the home? Well, you just take away their financial and political power, and that's where they'll be. So you go back to about 1850. Anyway, this, these are long, long conversations that have been going on for quite a while. Um, and 2016, this is before the election, but anybody who had been watching that and had studied with, at the same time as Marshall McLuhan was rising to ascendance, which I did, uh, would recognize that Trump had a very convincing up-close television persona at that time. I don't think he does anymore, but at that time he can sort of look you in the eye in a very convincing way out of the television screen. I, I saw his closing speech and I thought, he's good. Um, he's good at that. And um, it is a used car salesman manner, but 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 it comes across well on TV. I think McLuhan said the reason Nixon lost the election to Kennedy is that Kennedy was good on TV and Nixon wasn't. 
Anytime there's a new medium, people are mesmerized by it. My other theory is that Hitler never would have got so far if it hadn't been that radio had just been deployed. So when there's a new medium, such as radio or television or social media, people get entranced by it. After a while, it just becomes background noise, but, but at that moment, you think, I'm hearing a divine voice. <laughs> Luckily, Churchill was also good at radio. Some people say that World War II is won by Churchill's voice. Mm. Mm. You know, I'm struck that um, we're in a moment right now where, as you said, Earlier, you were talking about the poetry and zombies and that, you know, the past can, recalling the past, especially a past that's been repressed, mm -hmm. is a painful experience individually or collectively. And so I wonder how you think about um, remembering as a mode of resistance. Um, it's certainly a, a theme across many of your works. I mean, um, I, I, oh, go ahead. I think it's a, a mode of resistance if you're remembering some something that people have tried to erase. Mm. Uh, so something important that people have tried to erase. Um, a lot of murder mysteries turn on this. You know? Right. The buried evidence. You thought you were dreaming, but that really happened. <laughs> so it can be like that, but as we know, there's such a thing as false memory syndrome, and you can remember things that didn't happen. Um, anything in in human existence is is tricky. Uh, I don't think any anything about human beings is transparently simple. Um, so yes, it's it's uh, it is a, it's a theme. I I wrote a book about debt, in in which I examined debt for many different uh, sides, including what it means in re, in religious. Uh, traditions, but one of the other themes is that without memory, there is no debt, because debt is um, a memory of a transaction that occurred in the past. So when the peasants revolted in in medieval and Renaissance and early modern Europe, the first thing they did was was go to the castle and burn their records. <laughs> Then nobody would know who owed what to anybody. <laughs> so a, a debt is a memory. I just am curious what you think about a figure like, I mean, as we think about moving forward from this moment, um, and nobody knows what that's going to look like, but certainly the story is uh, contested in many ways, right? Um, in, in Canada, um, which I've heard again and again from Americans um, who think of it as a place of refuge. It's a place of refuge in your writing as well, sort of, in the Testaments and, and in uh, Handmaid's Tale. But, you know, we have an example of a prime minister who in many ways tried to rewrite history, who defunded libraries and archives, who rewrote the story of Canada and left out certain kinds of identities. I mean, what impact do you think, you know, who was a, a leader who was animated by a kind of a stance against science, um, an alignment with a kind of religious Harper. power? Harper. Harper, Stephen Harper. What, what influence and impact has that had on Canada and the moment that country finds itself in now? Well, you know, Canada is a tryout place. So I think Harper was a tryout for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> like a franchise. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Uh, it's the same playbook. And uh, if, if you go back to, you know, dictators I have known, um, what they put on the flag and what they, um, you know, how they decorate the space, it, it's different. Um, but, the, but the playbook is pretty much the same. And one thing that they all try to do, and this is what 1984 chronicles so brilliantly, they try to remove truth as a category. And you have seen that in action in your own country. Um, and, and Russian disinformation, they, they, they weren't necessarily supporting 
one candidate and attacking another. They were attacking the idea of truth. Because if you have people who don't know what to believe, you have a confused uh, population without any direction. So the, the aim of, of them is not to elect this person or to elect that person, but to, to get rid of the rudder of the ship of state, uh, to make it directionless, um, simply for, for Machiavellian power politics reasons. It gives them more scope. Mm -hmm. It gives they themselves more scope. So you'll notice that Putin has not rushed to congratulate Joe Biden. Um, he did with Trump, Trump because he saw Trump as, a, as um, a fomenter of chaos, and that suited him just fine. So the American people united uh, around a, an, an idea that pulls them together. That's bad news for, for him. I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience and just remind everyone, if you do have questions for Margaret Atwood, please um, uh, send them via the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So Julia Thayer writes, I started reading your novels thanks to a wonderful English teacher. I've enjoyed all of them, but the blind assassin captured me completely. Do you have a writing experience you've most enjoyed? Um, I would never tell if I did, but but let's hear it for wonderful English teachers, uh, because I had a wonderful English teacher too, um, at the time I began writing. So wonderful English teachers in high school can make a lot of difference, and also ones in college. That's my little wonderful English teacher speech. <laughs> Did teaching enrich your writing? I mean, you taught for a long time. I'm just curious how it how it shaped you as a writer. Less long than you may think. Um, really not very much at all, but one year in Montreal, um, some in Edmonton, one year in, in Toronto. And then from time to time, I, I will turn up and do maybe three months of something uh, as, a, as, a as a guest chair. Um, it, it does. I, I like teaching. I'm quite pedantic. And uh, <laughs> I like teaching particularly Victorian and, and American romantics, which are the things I know a bit about. Um, I, I don't think I would probably, I'm, I'm not much of a theorist. Uh, I'd probably uh, come from the, let's read the text first. Uh, when I was doing uh, my studying, it was the new criticism, and we didn't learn anything about writers' biographies. I, I think that was a mistake, uh, because every writer has a time and place, and and um, what were the what were the pressures? What were the influences? What were the energies? What did they think they were saying? Um, I think that is important. I don't think you can just do an ex explication du text and leave all of that out. But I, similarly, trying to second guess what the writer must have been thinking, that's a bit problematic too. Um, so yeah, I, I like teaching. I sometimes teach creative writing, and and when I do, if, if it's people with novels, I concentrate only on the first five pages because that's reality. If you really want to be a writer, and you really want to be a published writer, and you really want to have your books in a bookstore, that's what happens. The reader walks into the bookstore. They are entranced by your spectacular cover. Let's suppose they haven't heard your name before. They're entranced by your excellently chosen title and your spectacular cover, and they pick up the book. And what's the first thing they do? They open the front, front flap, and they, they read about the book. And you, the author, will have rewritten that because that task will have been given to the um, to the youngest person in the company, so you you, you have to redo it. So so it's good. And then they might read your biography and look at your picture. But the next thing they do is open it to the first page. And if you can't get them past the first page, they'll never get to page twenty. 
And if they'll never get to page 20, they will never get to page 86, where the most important thing you have to say is embedded. <laughs> so you have to get them into the book. So that's why I say you've put too much on the first page. Uh, you haven't put enough on the first page. Uh, let's look at your first sentence. And, and we go on from there. And one of the texts I use is Dracula. Why is that? Because the first part of Dracula is man on a train writing a quite boring travel journal. You know, the peasants, I tried some goulash, I looked out the window, the mountains are nice. And the, the difference is that the man writing that, that journal doesn't know that he's in a book called Dracula. But we readers know. So it's very suspenseful for us, but not for him because he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> want to say don't don't get off the train turn around go right back <laughs> don't get into that strange looking vehicle um but he's he's all unsuspecting you do have to wonder in horror films why do they open the door <laughs> haven't they seen a horror film before don't then, they know <laughs> they've seen no horror films that's just it they should all see some immediately and then they will go Oh, I don't think I'm going to open that door. I'm not <laughs> that seller. <laughs> you joking? Maybe that's the human condition that we don't recognize the genre we exist in. Like, maybe we're living the gothic, and if we just recognize that, we would have a much better guide to life. That's pretty profound. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can start a cult around that very idea. You can say to to each of your cult members, "I will help you identify the literary genre that you are living in." <laughs> And then I will, yes, I will analyze you based on that furthermore, so I can keep the relationship going and, you know, make some money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an idea. Go for it. It's an idea. Yes, an idea. Um, so you were just talking about what you focus on when you're teaching creative writing, but there's a question that asks, what is the single most important step in your writing process? So putting aside, you know, you know, you're going to rewrite your biography and you're thinking about your opening gambit but what what else i mean you one of the things i love about um the end of the testaments is there's a short conversation with you in the archive of the handmaid's tale um which is an amazing thing that there is an archive for the handmaid's tale and and all the research that you did it's a repository for that so i imagine research is a critical important thing but um what to you is the most important step starting <laughs> It's like, I'm like everybody else, you know, there's the page, you've got to put something on it. Are you going there? So, so Alison, you went to Lake of the Woods as a young person. Did you go swimming in it? Oh, yes. And how cold was that? Bitterly cold. Okay. So that, cold. I'm putting you on the verge of that moment. You're in your bathing suit, you stick your foot in the water, it's freezing cold. And you say, am I going to do this or not? So it's like that. So getting those first paragraphs on the page is like going swimming in Lake of the Woods. You just have to run in screaming. <laughs> no, it's going to be horrible, but you, you're either going to do it or not do it. And if you're going to do it, you just have to take the plunge. Uh, oh, um. As a lover of new mediums, you were just talking about people's fascination with mediums, and that's part of how people become leaders by, you know, marshalling the forces of whatever new medium. Uh, Tim Martin wants to know, have you ever considered producing your own podcast or YouTube channel? I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I can be on other people's podcasts and YouTubes um, because they do the work of producing it. But think of all the things I would have to learn. Uh, I would have to learn a lot of tech. I would have to learn, um, you know, deep fake, stick a head, somebody's head on a goat. I'm, I would have to learn how to do that. <laughs> Those are arts. So I think I don't think I would be able to to get good enough at it soon enough to to do it in any way well. You just need a good producer. Well, 
Um, maybe not, Alison. I think <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> um, there are so many questions here. Sorry, give me a minute. Um, one is then, oh, other than dystopian fiction, do you think there's any other works of literature that can help somehow dissect or help people understand the dangers of conspiracy theories in the real world? Mm, murder mysteries, uh, or probably spy thrillers. Um, so one of the necessary books of the 20th century to me, anybody who wants to try to understand that century, would be Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and the follow-up called Smiley's People. And they're both by John le Carre. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in, uh, in constructed fakes and um, forgeries and, and lying. And that's where you find people um, leading other people down the garden path. So conspiracy theories you don't know whether the people actually believe them or not. You, you don't know whether they're, they're doing it for fun, whether they're doing it because they really believe it, or whether they're doing it to, to make money. You, you actually don't know. Um, but uh, because of social media, these things can snowball in a, in a pretty wild way. Um, but things could snowball before there even was. Um, social media. As I say, radio was, was Hitler's thing. And he put out a lot of conspiracy theories in that way. It's, it's whatever people are mesmerized by at the time. You know, one way that um, people have thought about the connection between your novels and your poetry is that somehow they're in conversation with one another, like surfacing was in conversation with power politics. The collection of poetry. Do you agree with that? No. no? <laughs> what do you see as a connection, or do you see a connection? Do no. we need to see sometimes a connection? Sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. So there, there's a very clear connection between a poem sequence called The Journals of Susanna Moody and the novel called Alias Grace, yeah. uh, because the same real historical figure appears in, in both of them. And it was through writing the Susanna Moody poems that I that I learned about this character called, um, or this person called Grace Marx. And um, I actually wrote a, I wrote a television play about her in which I, the, I used the version of her story that had been told by Susanna Moody. As it happens, it was wrong. So when I really started writing about her and going back to newspapers of the day and whatever else it could be found, uh, Susanna Moody had got a lot of things wrong. She got the place wrong. She got the time wrong. She <laughs> she got uh, what happened wrong, and um, I think because she had read a lot of Charles Dickens, she was she was channeling Oliver Twist to a considerable extent. Um, so that was very interesting to discover and a very interesting book to write for the simple reason that the truth was never known. We, we knew something had happened, but we never knew what. Because there were four people involved. Uh, three of them uh, were dead pretty soon, and the fourth one never told, namely Grace. So it was a very interesting book to write because I couldn't come down on one side or the other did she or didn't she? Because historically, it wasn't known. And people projected on her like mad, though so they projected their own, um, their own views of women, they projected their own views of young Irish women, they projected their own views of servants, they projected their own views of, of um, the people who got murdered. So the, the, the more, um, liberal people tended to think she was innocent, and the more conservative people thought she was guilty. You know, I want to, I, we're going to have to wrap up, which I really don't want to do, but um, I was thinking about, as you were talking, the kind of open-ended nature of, of some of your works. Um, 
to me the the testaments i mean the handmaid's tale in a way the testaments too where there's this kind of ending another academic symposium and they're kind of trying to make sense of you know these this monument and their understanding right which is an imperfect one but also that adam the way it ends which it's it's kind of a beautiful ending and you can see that this the chronicling that's so important the kind of telling of story that structures that narrative so beautifully is going to continue but there's to what end you know will then the children of crake become like crake or will they destroy the world we don't know there's kind of an open-endedness there which i really appreciate um so we can project a lot of things onto it but I think a lot of us want to project hope onto the world right now. And there was a question that seems like a nice question to end with, which is, where are you finding hope? What, what right now is your source of hope as we move forward um, in a continuing, very uncertain time? Yeah, so, so right now I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about the under 20-year-olds that we are seeing come along. Um, they are fueling the extinction rebellion they are they're making politicians pay attention to the plight of the biosphere um, if we destroy the biosphere that's the end of us we will not be a species on the planet anymore um, so so vote to be a species <laughs> if you want if you want there to be people that's what, what it comes down to and um, the the activism and and joining together in community of, of movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, which is so so there's always there's always a push and pull between between I and we, mm. you know, between between I communities in which the individual is is most valued and we communities in which the group is most valued and and every society has got both but it goes back and forth in, in emphasis. Um, so the the real um, impetus of, of joining together as we is to make it more possible, or it should be, um, to make it more possible for the I, for the individual, to exist in a better way. Um, but in order to do that, you often have to come together as a we. And as it turns out, Americans in general are actually pretty good at doing that. Uh, everything from bank sales to... Um, <laughs> uh, working for for political parties in elections, and um, and and even demonstrating, you know, people go blah blah blah, violent blah blah. Not really. If if you want to look at really violent demonstrations and sort of out outbreaks of of um, mass uh, atrocity, you you kind of at this point in time have to go elsewhere in them in the world. Um, so, um, Yugoslavia after the breakup, it's not, and, and that, that's to be commended. So what are you going to do now? You're, you're going to work hard to rebuild the ability to listen to other people, to hear what they're actually saying, uh, to not just stick them in a box and put a label on it either way. Uh, to not demonize, to understand that people have got their reasons for doing the things they do and for thinking the things they think. But I'm hoping also that you will reassert the category called truth. Uh, because unless we, uh, unless we can rely on, on the truth of a matter, our opinions about it are worthless. They're not founded on anything. So let's reassert the category truth. No, it's not all fake news. Some of it's real news. <laughs> and, and foil the attempts uh, of people who want America to fail, uh, foil the attempts to erase the category called truth. It's true that my novels are sometimes open-ended, but that doesn't mean there wasn't a truth. It just means that we don't know what it was. How about that? Is that hopeful enough? <laughs> That's a good start, I think. Um, thank you so much and happy birthday in advance. I know you've got a birthday coming up. Yeah. You are forever young uh, and forever wonderful. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you and good luck with everything. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.